Hey guys, this week we are celebrating Pentecost, which is where we celebrate the gift of the Holy Spirit. Daniel and I are basing this video sermon around Acts chapter 2. We will be reading parts of it, um, but if you want to pause and grab it, or if you want to have it out for reference while we play this video, feel free. Um, before we begin, I want to acknowledge a couple of things. One, for me, this feels super awkward. I don't like watching myself on camera, and I don't like being recorded. Um, two, videos are often used for entertainment, and so a video sermon kind of feels a little disingenuous, uh, but we're going to try and be as genuine as we can through this format. Um, third, Pentecost is a time when we celebrate the gift of the Holy Spirit. I think that for most of us, Pentecost makes us uncomfortable because the spiritual world makes us uncomfortable. Also, um, the church has a wide range of understandings about what happened at Pentecost um, in regards to speaking in different tongues, and a lot of us are coming at this from different backgrounds. Um, so I just want to put those things out there and acknowledge them. Um, and finally, Daniel and I are not professionals, as we've said several times before, um, and this might be a little different for everyone. Um, but I hope that God uses this video sermon to speak to you regardless of all of these things. Um, in terms of an introduction, Daniel and I decided to do a sort of question-answer format for this video. The Holy Spirit is a tough topic to cover, and we felt like this was kind of the best way to get in a range of questions. Um, so we'll be introducing a question, um, talking about why we thought it was important, and one or both of us will be answering it. We're going to try to, as I mentioned before, uh, but we're going to follow the chronological content of that chapter. Um, so before we go any further, let's pray. Again, um, I'm going to acknowledge that I wrote this prayer down ahead of time. I'm reading it, um, but I am still going to offer it up nonetheless. Father, calm our hearts quiet our minds. Help us to take this time to hear from you. May it be your words and not mine or Daniel's that are heard. And may your message in whatever language be conveyed. Finally, Lord, may we learn more about you through this time. Amen. Um, so we're going to pose <coughs> the first question. If I were to describe the Holy Spirit in my own words, I often play off of the word advocate in the Bible. And I have a little bit of an overactive imagination. So when I think of the word advocate, I often picture a boxer. And I picture sort of what I would say as an invisible boxer, a robe, hood up, gloves, standing beside me. And I picture this invisible boxer advocating for me throughout the day. So I often see these spirits of anger, of jealousy, of deceit coming at me. And I think that there's someone boxing those things away so that the fruits can come through. The fruits of spirits of peace, patience, gentleness, and love. And so I picture this invisible boxer walking with me and advocating for me throughout the day. And if I were to talk about the Holy Spirit in today's context, in today's coronavirus May 2020 context, I would describe the Spirit as a Spirit of grace. And this is an example of how I think that Spirit could play out. I was running through the park and on my way back, the last part of my run is straight uphill to my house. And as I was looking up the hill, I saw a bunch of people on the sidewalk, social distancing, but they were taking up a lot of the sidewalk. And so if I were to run on the sidewalk, I didn't have a mask on and I was going to run right through their conversation. So I decided to run in the street instead. And in that moment, I was tired and I lashed out at these people in my mind from tiredness and from anger. And I thought, I have a daughter with extreme susceptibility to respiratory illness. How can you not be wearing masks? Why are you taking up all the sidewalk? This is so rude. And I imagine that in my mind, this group of people responded with, why are you running in the street? That is such an overreaction to this situation. We are social distancing. We are six feet apart. Why are you out in the street? But God gave me a different vision for how that could play out. And I realized, what if both parties were to bring a spirit of grace to that situation? 
What if I believed they were doing the best they could to be respectful of me? And what if they realized I was doing the best I could to be respectful of them? In these times of heightened emotions and immense paranoia, what if instead of anger and self-defensiveness, we brought spirits of grace to each interaction we had? What if we gave each other the benefit of the doubt? I know that I often lack grace. And so when I say this, I, I'm saying it to myself as much as I am to anyone who chooses to watch this. But I believe that this is the work of the Holy Spirit, allowing us to see each other through a lens of grace, allowing us to see each other through God's eyes. And I think that that boxer, that advocate that stands beside us can protect us against all of those negative emotions and has said, allow that lens of grace, that lens of love to come through. And so if I were to describe the Holy Spirit in modern day context, in my own words, that's how I would do it. <clears throat> Honestly, the Holy Spirit makes almost no sense to me. I think it is probably the most mysterious thing about the gospel even more mysterious than the resurrection. I have no idea how someone comes back from the dead, but at least I understand what it means. I can clearly describe the before and after state. I can barely describe the Holy Spirit to myself or to other followers of Jesus in a meaningful way, much less to the world. Mostly I believe that the Spirit is important because of how it's acted in my own life. I've taken a lot of steps that don't make sense, came just from me. And I think I've seen at least some of the fruit of those steps. And I've seen how God worked in my life and even through my life. And I don't believe all those things are just from me. I've also seen what I believe to be the work of the Spirit in others. For instance, I once had a friend from another country who didn't believe in God but badly wanted to because of the love he saw in the community of believers I was a part of. Despite his background and all the reasons he shouldn't believe, he eventually came to believe and his life was completely changed as a result. I believe that was the work of the Holy Spirit. Lastly, I do believe the Bible and it talks a lot about the Holy Spirit. In particular, in John 16, 7, Jesus said, But very truly I tell you, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the Advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. The Advocate, Jesus speaks of, is is the Holy Spirit. And Jesus said that given a choice between him, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit, we are better off with the Spirit. That's a pretty big deal. I often wish Jesus were right here with us. I don't know why we can't have both, but I do believe Jesus when he said that it is for our good. In Genesis 11, in the story of the Tower of Babel, it says God confused the language of the whole world and scattered them over the whole earth. Now here in Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit comes upon us and fills the believers, and then we see basically the opposite thing happen, a reversal of the Tower of Babel. Those of many languages and places are suddenly able to hear the Galilean believers in their own language. So Lauren, What's an example of how you've seen the Holy Spirit overcome language and cultural barriers? Daniel talked about the Holy Spirit almost kind of reversing what happened at the Tower of Babel. And I just thought that was such a great point, and I wanted to reiterate that again, that those who were set apart by language, by what happened at the Tower of Babel, were now able to communicate with one another. And that's the power of the Holy Spirit. And so at our church, I have seen the Holy Spirit work to create community. I think we all come from a lot of different backgrounds, racially, economically, even geographically from many different places. And we all bring a lot to the table, but it can be really hard to interact with someone who doesn't have the same customs that you do. But we give each other grace at this church. And I think 
the grace we give each other is a gift from the Holy Spirit. I recently watched the introduction video Bill put up on the YouTube channel, um, and I thought it was amazing, <laughs> way better quality than this one. But also, um, Bill said, we're not interested in providing a performance when you come to our church service. You will most likely be uncomfortable when you come here. And yet I think we persist with each other despite that discomfort. And that persistence is a gift from the Holy Spirit. I think emotionally we are all really connected in this church to one another. And it's something that you can't speak but you can, and you can't see it, but you can feel it when you come in. And when I learned about the diagnosis with Janie, many people came around me and prayed for me, but it wasn't always in English, and I didn't always understand what was going on. Despite that, I knew that they were pleading to God on my behalf, and on behalf of Janie, and on behalf of our family. And I felt like the Holy Spirit was connecting all of us through that. Finally, I think about how Ross um, talked about us being connected to one another by bridges and how those bridges get larger and stronger and can cross more territory the longer we're together. And I think the person building those bridges is the Holy Spirit because this church doesn't make sense and yet it works. Um, and that can only be because of the Holy Spirit. Cases making fun of what's happening. Peter gets up and starts preaching. He quotes the prophet Joel who said God would send the Holy Spirit and that would result in dreams, visions, prophecies, and wonders. Even as Christians, that sounds strange to a lot of us. Many of us tend not to pay much attention to those sort of things. In fact, we might try to avoid them. Lauren, do you have any examples of how God's Spirit has acted in your life through dreams, visions, prophecies, and wonders. I think especially in our day and time, uh, discussions of dreams, visions, prophecies, and wonders freak people out, uh, mostly because they can't be proven. There's no data, there's no statistics, there's no facts to tell or to post about on social media. Um, when what you saw was a dream, and honestly, sometimes I doubt the dreams I've had because I'm so used to ignoring the non-physical world, what's not right in front of me. And I think that this spiritual world freaks us out as 21st century Christians. Um, and so I've experienced this spiritual world, but it's, it's hard to describe and it exists more in colors and feelings and things that we aren't used to talking about. Uh, but there was one time that I wanted to share. Um, I was. I distinctly remember God speaking to me. I was pregnant with Malachi and I was 13 days past my due date. Um, and I was so frustrated uh, because I hadn't had Malachi yet, hadn't gone into labor. Um, I took a walk that night and it was a Wednesday night. Um, and I asked God, I was talking to God, when am I gonna have this baby? And I remember God saying, it will happen on Friday which is 15 days past my due date. And I thought, are you kidding me, God? That is not something that I wanted to hear, um, especially when every medical journal, every doctor, every um, professional is telling you that your risk of stillbirth goes up every day that you wait. But I heard God say, wait two more days. Um, and sure enough, I went into labor that Friday and Malachi was born on Saturday morning at 5 a.m. And I know that every medical professional would have said, you should have gone to the hospital. But I felt so strongly about what God said and that God said I needed to wait. Um, and hearing God's voice, it's still so distinct to me. Um, it gave me confidence, uh, the confidence I needed in my first weeks and months of being a mother. Because I knew God had spoken to me and I knew I'd heard him and I, I just I had confidence in that and it gave me the power to move forward. But I look back on that story now and it makes me hurt because I don't feel like I hear God's voice as strongly now. And it makes me question if I only heard God's voice in times of joy. I hope that's not true. I hope I can hear God's voice again someday as distinctly as I did then. Um, but I can still feel the spirit working in our life. In Genesis 1, it says that the spirit hovered over the waters 
And I believe that's why we feel this um, otherworldliness when we sit by the water, by bodies of water, because the Holy Spirit can hover above those waters. And this past week, I took uh, Janie on a hike to Patapsco, and she cried the entire walk, and I got a lot of stares. Um, but we finally got to a place where we could sit down. I wanted to take her out of the carrier and calm her down. And we sat down by that sandy river bank. I laid her on a blanket and she just fell asleep. And I felt such peace sitting by the water with my daughter. Um, and I felt the spirit there. And I got no word from God and I heard no voice. But there was a feeling deep inside of me when I recall that memory that I know is the Holy Spirit. And so there are things that I just feel like I don't have words for to explain, but I know that the Holy Spirit is working in our lives. What seems clear from part of Acts 2 is that one of the responses to the Holy Spirit being given is baptism. So if we pick up in verse 36, it says, therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. If we stop there for a minute, we see that he says, repent, be baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, and then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Um, so clearly from this, there is this emphasis on baptism that happens. If you continue on in the chapter, picking up um, in verse 39, it says, the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. So from this uh, portion of the scripture, we can see that the physical act of baptism is important and connected with the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so I'm gonna pose a question to Daniel. Daniel, can you tell us a little about your baptism and what led you to be baptized? I grew up going to church as long as I can remember and don't ever remember not believing in God. When I was eight years old, I decided I wanted to follow Jesus. With some help from my mom and one of my sisters, I prayed asking God to forgive me of my sins and saying I wanted to follow him, an important step in my journey. But honestly, it wasn't the beginning and it certainly wasn't the end. I started reading the Bible more, especially the stories of Moses, many of which I thought were quite exciting. I didn't get baptized at the time, though, and eventually my enthusiasm waned. In high school, after a particular sermon, I decided to get baptized. I can't really explain precisely what happened that day, and I didn't even really notice at the time, but I believe the Holy Spirit filled me in a new way. In the months and years ahead, the Holy Spirit worked in me in ways that I had not experienced before and through many ups and downs brought me to where I am today. Lauren, could you share a little bit about your baptism story? Growing up, we did an infant baptism. So I figured as I became more involved with Christian groups and started making more Christian friends, I kind of figured I had already done infant baptism. So I didn't need to get baptized again. That was what I thought. Um, but when I was in college, I made a lot of friends who were involved in young life and I saw a lot of adult baptisms. But the baptisms I saw my friends do made me really nervous because they weren't just sprinkling a little bit of water on them in a service. They were dunking them in a tank or going out to the river or swimming in the ocean. And it was a very public display of faith. And it made me really nervous because all my life I had been taught not to publicly display what I believed. But when I moved to Baltimore after college, I started volunteering with Urban Young Life, and I felt more and more moved per to pursue a public faith. Ultimately, I decided to get a master's degree in youth ministry, and along with that, I felt like I needed to get baptized as an adult. I felt like I needed to make a public declaration of my faith. 
I wanted to say, I'm in Baltimore for you, Lord. I'm living my life as an adult for you. It's on me what I choose now, and I choose you, Lord. And I think that in spite of everything we've gone through in Baltimore, God has been faithful and he has blessed us. And so for me, baptism was a step to take to publicly declare my belief in God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Our fourth and final point from Acts chapter 2 is the importance of community. It seems clear from this chapter that community is an important part of living life with the Holy Spirit. First of all, the Holy Spirit was given to a group of believers, not to just one individual. And second, at the end of chapter 2, we see the famous description of Christian community. Starting in verse 42, it says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone in need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying all of the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. So Daniel, could you talk a little about how this fits in with the Holy Spirit and Pentecost? On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he prayed that we may be one as we are one. I and them and you and me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Jesus was asking that the oneness of the Trinity be extended to all those who would believe in him, oneness with him, and therefore with the Trinity, and also oneness with each other. I believe that the Holy Spirit is God's answer to this prayer. Colossians 1, 26 to 27 says, the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to God's people, to them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you, that's the Holy Spirit, that's the mystery. So then we come to this description of life in the church at its very beginning. It could be summarized simply as they lived as one, one with each other and one with God. And this was the power of the Holy Spirit, Spirit oneness, Christ in us and us in Christ the mystery hidden for ages, true community. Of course, things weren't perfect, and if we keep reading, we see that the early church soon ran into their fair share of issues and troubles, but we see how the Holy Spirit was changing their way of living. I loved Laurel's reflection on this passage during one of the recent gatherings last week, I think. She asked if we would want that. Would we want to live in a church like what's described in Acts 2? It sounds so nice, but if we're honest, it's not what we really want, at least not all of it. We all want meaningful community, signs and wonders, glad and sincere hearts, the favor of all people, and a growing community. We want all those things, but devoted to the teaching of the word, being together all the time, sharing everything, selling our stuff, I have other interests. Sometimes I want a little space. I like my stuff, and sometimes I want to keep it to myself. The truth is, if it weren't for the Holy Spirit, we would have left this church in Baltimore long ago. Don't get me wrong, we love you guys and we care about you guys, and Baltimore is great. And I'm not saying we're super spiritual because we aren't, but I am saying community, family, is hard. And what scares me the most is that I know we have only just barely scratched the surface. A lot of me wants to turn around and get out of here because I know it's only going to get harder. But Jesus sent his spirit to live in us. And somehow, each day, his spirit helps us and we grow little by little. And I see others growing little by little. And I believe that maybe with a lot of help from the spirit, we'll learn to be one with each other and one with God. So I want to wrap us up with three quick things. 
Some of you may be feeling a call or contemplating taking the next big step in your journey with God. Maybe it's calling on the name of the Lord for the first time. Maybe it's baptism. Maybe it's confessing an area of sin in your life and repenting. Maybe it's simply answering a call to follow. My encouragement is simply to answer the Lord's call. It is scary, I'll admit, but I've never regretted doing so. Lauren and I are happy to share more of our stories or talk with anyone who has questions about them. There is no doubt in my mind that God desires to fill us as a church with His Spirit and see that result in oneness and community. It will be hard, though. It will require great sacrifice from all of us. I pray that God's Spirit blows through us so violently and burns in us so strongly that we can't help but overcome our brokenness and our differences and be filled with love for each other, even when it requires great sacrifice. All of us, truly all of us, are experiencing difficulties at this time. The Holy Spirit is not subject to social distancing guidelines. Because the power of the Holy Spirit, because of the power of the Holy Spirit, we can still be one with each other and one with God. So let's pray. Father, we call upon your name. We ask that you accomplish your work in the lives of each person listening and in our church community. I ask in the name of Jesus that you pour your spirit out upon us so that we can't help but be changed and live differently, even if it costs us everything. 